Welcome, everybody. I'm Mark David, founder of the Institute for the Psychology of Eating. We're back in the Psychology of Eating podcast, and I'm with Haley today. Welcome, Haley. Thank you so much, Mark. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad we're doing this. So the idea is we're going to spend some time together, and you and I haven't met before, and I'm going to do my best to help you with whatever you would like to accomplish with food and body. So if you could wave your magic wand and have whatever you want relative to food, body, health, what would that be for you? It would be consistently choosing the right foods, the healthy foods, consistently, Mm. you know, just day in and day out. So consistently choosing the right foods and the reason you want to consistently choose the right foods would be. Well, obviously, I mean, from a physical point of view would be to maintain my weight because mm-hmm. when I don't choose the right foods, my weight goes up and down. So I would like to maintain my weight, but I'd also like to maintain my health. And as I've said, I have fibro, fibromyalgia. So I do need to eat consistently well to manage mm-hmm. that chronic pain and I need to manage my sleep. So consistent eating for me is not about the size I'm at, it's about my, mostly about my sleep patterns. And if I can't eat well consistently, I can't sleep well. Fascinating. So mm-hmm. how, when, when were you diagnosed with fibromyalgia? So I was only diagnosed about three months ago and oh, wow. I've been battling for over 12 years. But unfortunately, living in South Africa, you know, um, specialists are just unaffordable unless you've got massive medical aids, which I didn't have. So when I moved to the UK, I, um, I had a massive uh, back spasm and landed up in the A&E. And fortunately here, you know, you get to see a specialist because you're in the system. So I had the back spasm, went back to the doctor. He realized something was wrong. He forwarded me to the rheumato- rheumatoidologist. So, yeah, it was only three months ago, but, but, but I've been battling with it for about 12 years. And is there any specific course of treatment? Are you on any kind of medications? Were you prescribed any kind of diet? Well, the type of fiber I have is more on the hypermobility side. So I'm, I'm hypermobile and I have been since I was young. So I've pushed my joints much further than they were able to be strong at. So the rheumatoid just said to me that I don't have the inflammatory fibromyalgia where, you know, you have to eat an anti-inflammatory foods. But she did say to me that obviously having a healthier diet, low in sugar, um, you know, low in processed foods would, would obviously help you. Um, it would help me also to sleep better. And if I sleep better, the pain is less. So you see, that's the link there. So let's say you wake up and you didn't sleep well the past evening. When the pain shows up for you, does it land in specific <laughs> places? Is it, is it, um, yeah. can you just give me a, a brief description of what kind of pain? Well, I'm always in pain. I'm never not in pain. There's, I'm always in pain somewhere. And um, the rheumatologist said to me that that's just going to be the rest of my life. It's mm-hmm. about management. So, but my main pain areas are my left hip and my left shoulder and my left neck, my left neck. It's all on my left side um, mm-hmm. where I have the flare ups, you know, I call it a flare up. And um, yeah, but, but I am in pain all the time. I mean, I'm in pain just sitting here. So I'm in pain all the time. Got it. So you said this started 12 years ago. How old were you at that point? I was, well, I'm 39 now. So I think I was 28, 27. (laughs) I was 27. um, And I put it down to the fact that I had done 10 years of martial arts and then went straight into long distance running. And, you know, from being in South Africa, if you, if you, if you haven't done comrades, you're not a runner. So the pressure was on. So I went straight from 10 years of martial arts, all on my left side, kick, kick, kick um, into long distance running, which was a very repetitive movement. And the Karos who I've seen for 12 years have all just said, oh, you know what? It's just you run. All runners have pain. You know, all runners have pain. It was always put down to the fact that I was a runner. But then I stopped running. And the pain never went away. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it actually got worse. And that's, that's when I had MRIs and they found a tear in my hip and they found bulging discs in my lower spine. Um, but the rheumatologist said to me that the structural damage is not bad enough to constitute the amount of pain I'm in. So that's where she said it's, the, it's, it's a chronic pain syndrome. Yes. So 
What at the time when you took up running? So how long ago did you take up running? It was 12 years. Okay. So what inspired you to take up long distance running? Well, the pressure of living in Durban where everybody was a runner. Uh (laughs) But not only that, um, because I had done martial arts for so many years, I was very used to that, um, that mental discipline of focusing myself on a sport. So when I stopped martial arts, I didn't have anything to focus on mentally and I needed that drive. I needed that focus. So long distance running, when you're out 20, 25 miles, the only thing that's going to get you back is your mental endurance. So that's how I got addicted to, you know, being out there on the road for extended period of time. Got it. Are you in relationship now? Do you have kids? I'm married. I'm married. I have two children. Um, so I have a, and I have my own business and I work somewhere. So I have a very full life. <laughs> Good for yeah. you. How old are your kids? They are eight and six. Oh, how sweet. Great they ages, are. right? They are. They are. I unfortunately can't pick them up anymore, but they are great ages. Yeah. So when you don't eat well, mm. what does that look like? So, as I said, I had an eating disorder um, from, from, I can remember the age of three. And I say the age of three because that's when my dad left my mom. So, I learned from a very early age that food is comfort and food is what you do when you're sad or happy or out of the house. You just eat. So, I grew up with that and I found in my teens, um, I would Whenever I was anxious, I would land up in a binge. And it was a very unconscious binge. There was no mindfulness at all. So I would lock myself in the kitchen or in the room or whatever, and I would just eat all of the the biscuits, the muffins, and all the carbohydrates, sugary, sweet stuff. Um, And I did that for probably 20 years. Um, Mm -hmm. So this is where the inconsistency came in. So I would would be on a diet. I'd be running and doing my martial arts. And then on the weekend, I was binging. So there was that there was that seven day binge cycle, um, and I could I could justify it by saying, well, you know, I've eaten well for six days, I deserve it. But actually, it I was binging because I felt deprived. Um, I maybe at the time had a broken relationship. So, you know, twenty years is a long time to carry a disorder, and so that's where the inconsistency came in. But what happened about five years ago is I managed to get a hold of my anxiety. I managed to sort out the triggers. So what happened then was the binging went away, which I thought, well, amazing. I'm obviously over my eating disorder. Mm -hmm. But then what happened was every time I went through a change in my life, so if I moved house or had a situation with a friend or work was different, whenever there was a change, I would all of a sudden not binge, but I would eat all the wrong things in a day. So I would stick to my five, three meals and two snacks, but it would be like muesli for breakfast, um, biscuits and chocolate for lunch, uh, maybe a bowl of ice cream for dinner. So I just spread out the binge. Uh, well, it wasn't a binge in my mind. It now became unhealthy choices. Yes. And that is where I'm still stuck is that, I mean, the thought of binging, I think I could think of nothing worse. I mean, I hate to feel full, but now I graze. And when I'm not feeling certain, I graze all the wrong things. And this is where my fibro flares up and this is where I don't sleep because when I have a graze of high carbohydrate stuff, I obviously don't sleep well and then I sweat. So then that wakes me up. And that happens like every three months. And when you say it happens every three months, how long does it last for when you start doing that? Well, it used to last three months. Um, I, I would have a graze like that for three months. And then I would kind of, no, no, find the, new, the next diet. I was a dieter. So body for life, you know, fit for life, whatever, this, that. I, I was like, I was looking for the next commitment device. And then I would do it. And I'm so committed. So I would lose the weight and get slim. But then the minute something changed in my life or I had an issue with my husband or anything, anything changed, I resorted back to the food. So now I'm in a situation where even tonight, you know, coming on here with you, knowing that I've never done this before, knowing that I've never met you before, knowing that it's going to be a bit vulnerable, I had biscuits and muesli for lunch. Mm-hmm. And, and I can't seem to connect the dots between why am I still doing that, you know? I get that I'm not binging anymore. I'm over that anxiety. I'm actually medicated for anxiety now. But I can't make the link as to why I still make those choices when I'm feeling uncertain. 
I tell myself I'm safe. I tell myself I've got a lovely relationship. I tell myself my kids are perfect. I tell myself I don't need to seek my identity in my body. You know, I go through all the cognition mm-hmm. and then I have a bowl of muesli. <laughs> it is uh, crazy. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm at least glad you can laugh at it in this moment because I've been, I've been doing it for so long. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the mind is an interesting creature. It can know certain things, but knowing doesn't necessarily <laughs> translate into doing. Yeah. And, and that's where things get really confusing because yes, you, you know, you have all these good things in your life. And yeah. at the same time, these behaviors are repeating themselves. And then you, so, I know I'm doing it. So, which is also tough. Like I know I'm doing it, but why can't I stop? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So we're going to, we're going to play around a little bit with that. I just have to ask you a, a few more questions for me to sort of hone in on where I think the action is for you. So forgive me if I bounce around a little bit more, if I was just talking to your husband right now, And I said to him, why do you think Haley has the eating patterns and challenges that she has? What do you think he would say? Um, He doesn't see a lot of it. I I don't tend to do it in front of him. Um, You know, I don't tend to do it in front of him. But he has always he's always noticed my anxiety and he'll say it's her anxiety. She's uncertain of the change coming and, you know, she's eating because of it. That's what he would say. It's my anxiety. Yes. Which I'm medicated for. So, yeah. So, and and how long have you been on medication for anxiety? So only about a year and a half. um, Whereas I've had anxiety since I was a little girl. I mean, I, my mom, I grew up in a very anxious home. My mom was anxious. I learned that, that habit very young. Yes. Um, so it, it has it been so how would you characterize since you've been on anxiety medication for a year how, to to what degree has it helped you so i'm a lot less angry um i found when i wasn't medicated um any little thing with the kids would just ah! I, I couldn't control them you know they were young so i was like ah just stop it stop it um i had a very short fuse and now that I've been on the medication, I'm like, it's okay. We'll do this. You know, we'll, we'll get through it. I don't seem to get that trigger so quickly. Yes. Um, that's been the biggest shift. And I've also been able to analyze and reflect because I'm not so busy running on this treadmill of trying to cope, yes. you know, um, I'm tr- trying so hard to just strive, strive, strive. And now that I'm not striving anymore, I'm not more reflective, which I think is helping because of medication. Excellent. 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 And it sounds like with all those good benefits, there's still a baseline of anxiety. Is that yeah. correct? Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah, because it comes out at night in my dreams. Um, so the tablet wears off and then at nighttime I'm a mess. I sweat and I dream and I have, oh, just constant. So that makes, then I don't sleep. So now I'm taking it in the morning and the evening. Yes. Which is like, oh, well, why am I taking this thing to mask anxiety if anxiety is actually not going away? And then I just say to myself, well, you know, your mom was anxious, so that's your lot. Like, it's just going to be there, you know? When was the last time you went on a vacation? <laughs> uh, next question. <laughs> um, sure. So I took a month off last year, December, but I was leaving and moving and immigrating. So it was by no means a holiday. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I no. haven't been on an actual holiday where I switch off um, and not move. Or So I've moved 15 times. I've moved 14 times in 15 years. Mm. So you see, there's those constant changes. In two years, I actually lived in three houses. Um, so I've had a lot of change. So the last time I had a holiday, a genuine holiday where I didn't have to do anything, was when I was probably 2018 when I came to the UK. I had 10 days on my own. That was probably the last time. Yeah. Yes. And do you recall in those days in 2018, how was your pain level? How was your anxiety level? Well, I was overseas for the first time in 15 years. So I was very excited. Um, I think I always had pain. I didn't, it wasn't as bad as it's been in the last year. Um, 
but I was a lot healthier then. I was very much focused on my eating and I was focused on my training. So I was like really trying to keep it all together, you know, and um, I was, I think I was still running a little bit. So I was in a better space with regards to my health. Mm-hmm. Okay. And I was on holiday. So yeah, but since then I haven't had a holiday. So I have some thoughts I want to share with you um, about what I think might be happening for you as, as I'm listening I'm searching for and listening for what what might be some of the root causes mm-hmm. of what's happening for you. So I understand you want to be able to make good choices with food. I get that. I also consistently, consistently, consistently yeah. Mm-hmm. So you want to be able to make good choices with food consistently. Mm-hmm. And the reason why you want to make good choices with food consistently is, you know, not only will you feel better about yourself in general, but it then helps modulate and regulate pain, your sleep, which pain, helps sleep. modulate and regulate your pain. And when you regulate your pain, you're going to be a happier person. Exactly. So. My initial thought is that I don't, there might be a deeper approach to get where you want to go. Ultimately, to get where you want to go, the name of the game is, I want to be in less pain. Like, yeah. of course, you're like a lot of human beings who, who cares about your health. You, you, you want to eat well because there's all kind of good benefits from eating well. I want less but, pain and less fatigue. I want less yes. fatigue. Mm. So, so that's really your bottom line, less pain yeah. and less fatigue, or be normal and have little pain and little fatigue, except, you know, being a normal human being who has pains yeah. and gets tired. And be able to, to manage it, you know, and not have that downward spiral of, oh, I'm tired now. So, you know, the weeks are right off because I'm like flat on my back. I don't want to do that anymore. Yes, 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 yes. So, You've already identified that having that turning to food from a young age was a strategy you developed to help manage your emotional world because you grew up in an anxious environment. Your parents divorced when you were very young and you mentioned three years old. And even though you're only three at the time and a three year old doesn't have a lot of distinctions. Um, but at the same time, a three-year-old is very, very sensitive to and aware of her, his environment and her psychic environment yeah. and her energetic environment. And you're the, the two big people responsible for loving you and raising you and protecting you and making sure that you were okay. They weren't okay. <laughs> well, Exactly. And And I was left to fend for myself from a very young age. I know that. I was the only child. I started working when I was 15. I never felt safe. And you did a pod, you you did a Facebook live a couple of weeks or months ago. And you mentioned that eating is an emotional act. Like you you can't say, oh, I'm an emotional eater because eating is an emotional act. It's part of our structure. It's how we were created. And and then you mentioned something about uh, feeling safe. And I, it just, the penny dropped when you said that. I thought, I haven't felt safe my entire life. Bingo. Bingo. And I eat to feel safe. Because I used to thought I eat to feel certain, but I actually eat to feel safe. 100%. That's, that's a, and you said that in a, in, a, in a life. And I'm just so grateful because yes. the penny dropped. Yes. So you eat to feel safe, which, by the way, let's acknowledge is the perfect most intelligent strategy that a three-year-old can come up with. Because what does a three-year-old know? You're not going to go get counseling. You're not going to go read a bunch of books. Um, What you're going to do is you're going to rely on your unconscious instincts. And what your unconscious instinct knows is that, huh, you know, when I eat food, I feel better. I feel safer. I feel safer. I feel full. I feel satisfied. So what I would like to say is that... The part of you that's not making good choices for yourself consistently Mm -hmm. is the part of you that doesn't feel safe. Whenever I have a change, that's exactly it. Yes. Because in between, I'm amazing. I prep the food. I eat it. I'm like, I'm doing this. And then any unsafeness, and I'm like, oh, muesli and biscuits. 
Like that's the go-to. Yes. So, so we've established that from a very young age, you, 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 you essentially don't have a memory of feeling safe in this life because that's how you've started out. So another way of saying, I don't feel safe is I'm in a stress response. I'm threatened. This is, this is, this is not the kind of environment I can survive in. And so, I've been in that threat environment my whole life. I've only in the last probably six months come off that. I've, in the last six months, I've become aware of the threat cycle through you and through a couple of other courses that I've done. Yeah. I'm like, oh, my word, there's such a thing as a threat system. Mm-hmm. And there's a soothing system. And there's a drive system. Like, I didn't know those parts of the brain. And I've just been taught it this year. So now I'm like, wow, I've actually been living under threat yes. my whole life. Yes. My whole life. Yes. And, and please understand and please know that you're not the only person who feels that way. And on top of that, you, ha- you and I happen to live in a world that objectively is very threatening. <laughs> so, yeah, in South Africa as well. Being in South Africa yes. is very threatening. <laughs> yes. And, and we, were, we, were, we were talking before this, this conversation you know, started. And, you know, I was mentioning that I've, I've, I've been to your home country, South Africa, and yeah, I didn't feel safe at, during the times I traveled there. So objectively, you lived in an actual world, which was actually not safe. With two little baby girls. Yes. So your system doesn't know the feeling, the consistent feeling of Thank how you. to feel safe. So another way to say that is you've been in a long-term stress response. Yeah. And when we're in a long-term stress response, eventually what happens is that that stress response, that constant heightening Mm -hmm. of the sympathetic nervous system is going to eventually wear down at our weakest links. So you mentioned to me, oh, yeah, I was a runner and I did martial arts. And oh, yeah, you know, huh, I'm feeling pain in the left side of my body. That's where I'm kicking. That's where that's where my body uh, is doing repetitive motion. So to me, yeah, you know, your physical activity has impacted your body. That happens to, you know, so many human beings. But at the same time, more to the point the lifelong stress response, which some people would call trauma or yeah. post-traumatic stress yeah. disorder. And yeah, well, it is trauma on the mind and it is trauma on the body because everything that I was driven to do was a way of trying to feel safe, safe. or protected, exactly. but it never made me feel safe. So exactly. I would then just eat because that was the quickest way for me to feel safe. Bingo. So we will do, you will do your best to try to feel safe because that's how we're designed. We want to escape pain Mm -hmm. and get to pleasure. We want to escape threat and get to safety. Same thing. So, and and I mean, why is that, (coughs) excuse me, why is that? I mean, I, I know that pain, pain, pleasure concept. I know we avoid pain, you know, we seek pleasure and I know, you know, millions of years, that's how we were designed, but why is it so hard for us as human beings to stop that seeking, avoiding pain and seeking pleasure? Why is it so hard for us to stop that? Great question. Um, I'm going to offer my opinion to that answer. You know, there's, there's probably others who would agree with me. Essentially the mind, once it gets into a pattern and a habit is often very difficult to change the mind gets into these mm. grooves. Yeah. The mind gets into a rhythm. The mind gets into a pattern. And yeah. those patterns, oddly enough, make us have a certain amount of safety. So even though you reached for food to create safety, and even though it didn't purely do it, the reality is it kind of does it. Yeah, it symptomatically. It really makes you feel safe. Otherwise, yeah. you, you'd stop <laughs> doing it. Yeah. So... A habit like that, a groove like that, a pattern like that becomes ingrained in the nervous system. And simply the way we are designed, it is difficult, but certainly doable to unwind a long-term unconscious pattern. 
Sure, more 30 years, to, eh? 30 years, yeah. eh? Yeah, are you up for it? <laughs> You're right. More to the point, it is very difficult to unwind stress or trauma that hasn't naturally unwound itself. Yeah, yeah. It's just difficult for a human being to do that, in part because... Once again, we live in a world where there's daily stresses and there's daily challenges and and you have real challenges as a mother, as a wife, as a business person dealing for the last two years with the world of COVID. So so we're also living in a world that doesn't always support us to take a deep breath and relax and unwind. So so it's a practice and it's work. But here's what I want to say to you, that I think you're going to be able to get more where you want to go when you find the right way for you to begin to address the deeper pattern called, I don't feel safe. Yeah. Yeah. And that to me is where the action is. Yeah. No, I agree with you. Mm -hmm. Is for us to train your nervous system and it's a retraining. It literally is a retraining. It's retraining the nervous system to let the nervous system know you're safe. So even though your brain knows it, even though you said to me, Hey, I know it's cool. I know I got my life. I know things are okay. The body doesn't know that yet. Your nervous system doesn't know that because your nervous system still believes that it's not safe. So I can recommend Mm -hmm. two things for you to do that I know of. Can I just, uh, can I just, sorry, before I, before you do that, I just wanted to, so I used to go to any social event that I went to, it doesn't matter if it was a kid's party or anything, I would take myself off and eat in order to not have to to socialize. Yes. Because if I could hide behind the food, I wouldn't have to talk to people. Yes. So what is that? Is that not feeling safe? Like not even wanting to talk to people? I'd rather eat than talk to me. Is that just a not feeling safe thing? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I don't don't know why I did it. I don't feel safe in a social situation. I don't feel safe with other people. I don't feel safe that I'm going to be loved, accepted, cared for, um, befriended. Plenty of human beings at some point in their life will have a certain amount of social anxiety yeah. Because you don't know how people are going to respond. You don't know how people are going to act. You already grew up in a household where you pretty much modeled after your mom. She was anxious. In other words, your mom did not feel safe. No, and not at all. Not at all. No. Is your mom still alive? She is, um, but she's heavily responsible on me. I pay for her to live. She has dementia and she's in a home. Yeah. So um, at the age of 16, I became the mom and she became the child. And, yes. that, and that was 17 years ago. So yes. I'm the mom, she's the child. Yeah, which is yet another experience of I'm not exactly safe because now I'm the parent of my, my parent. mom. Yeah. Yes. So what I want to offer, not knowing anything about your mom, is that if we could dive into her story, she has so many good reasons, like you do as to why she didn't feel safe. And you might not even know what she went through as a child, as a young woman that created her nervous system response to the world. So she never felt safe. And that unsafety for you growing up as a child, you modeled after that, you absorbed that because this is my mother. I'm a female. She's a female. This is on our own. We had nobody else. We were on our own. My dad left. So, yeah. So that's who you modeled after. And you're at a time in your life. You mentioned you were 39. 39. Yeah. So this is a time in your life, you know, hitting age 40. I've been speaking to a lot of literally right on age 40 people lately And 40 is a powerful transition time in terms of life phases. Mm. 40 is when a human being begins to find her or his voice in a whole different way. We begin to really connect with this is who I am. So part of your task, and this is going to be a practice, is to 
deeply train your nervous system that you're safe. You're not going to be able to do that entirely just by yourself. So yeah. a couple of ways to do it. The two ways that I want to mention that I, I, I think are most um, direct and most effective is to a work with some sort of specialist, some sort of trauma specialist, mm -hmm. somebody who, who literally works with PTSD. And there are yeah. different kinds of therapies that work with PTSD. There's um, eye movement specialists. There are people who work with somatic sensing, mm -hmm. but if that's something that's available to you, that's affordable to you, um, I would explore and try to find out who is the best trauma therapist yeah. in your area that you can work with. Next. So, mm, I was going to say, it's interesting that you say that because I've just finished six sessions with a CBT therapist yes. and my eating didn't change. Yes. But what did what did change is she taught me about compassion oh, and great. to to talk to myself compassionately and become friends with myself. And, and that was a huge help. Yes. CBT is uh, cognitive behavioral therapy is not really going to put a dent in um, post-traumatic stress. Post-traumatic stress is is just a simple way of saying trauma or stress that lives in the system that never resolved. So in other words, you know. In a in a in in the natural course of events, if you ever went to Kruger National Park in South Africa and watched watched a lion or a hyena or any carnivore eat another creature um, or chase another creature, when a creature is being chased, they're in a stress response. They're in a life threatening situation, and the moment the creature stops being chased, if it gets away. It completely relaxes at some point. It forgets oh, about it. Done, I haven't done that. Yeah. So, so animals from in one nature, thing to next. yeah, they, they naturally, their, their, their stress response naturally unwinds itself. We and, as yeah. humans, we're very different. Our stresses can stay in the system because we're thinking and we're repeating those stresses. So in other words, the message you were given was, Haley, you're not safe. You're not safe. And then you take that message and you repeat it to yourself. Oh, I'm not safe. I'm not safe. So sure. another thing that you can do that's more self-driven um, is there's an, there's an excellent uh, online program system. It's called DNRS. DNRS. Um, okay. Yes. And it's, uh, uh, you know, I actually want to look it up as we're speaking so I can give you the um, actual website, it's called retrainingthebrain.com. Okay. So retraining the I brain. I actually heard of it. Who's, who's it done by? Um, there's a woman who invented this system and uh, her name is Annie Hopper. Okay. And it's a wonderful program. It's reasonably priced. You can begin to do it on your own at home. And it's just a lovely method for beginning to retrain your brain and retrain your nervous system, because a big part of the pain that you're experiencing is because your body is in ongoing stress response yeah. and stress will <coughs> multiply pain. So yeah. you could have a headache for natural reasons, but if you're really stressed out, that yeah. headache is going to be worse. Well, I get my flare ups when I'm stressed. I'm, I've seen that pattern. So if I have a very stressful thing happen, then my hip and my neck is just buggered. Yes. Buggered, buggered, buggered. So as you, you, I just wanted yeah. to say, like, you really hit the nail on the head because I've never considered myself to be someone who's been through trauma. I've never considered my, someone, myself to be somebody who's had PTSD, but I've always felt like I'm running. Yes. On you, the inside. Yes, 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 yes. What, uh, what am I running away from or what am I running towards? I always feel like I, I worked with a homeopath about 12 years ago and she did some, she did a whole little thing where you put nodules on and she said to me, what are you running away from? Yes. Your sympathetic nervous system is on overdrive. What are you running away from? Yes. And it's never, I never forgot it because... I mean, I, I've been through my fair share of trauma, you know, divorce. Um, my dad died when I was 17. He didn't allow me to see him. Um, my grand died in my arms. I went through the whole death process with her. Um, I've had many 
hard times with my husband. Um, my mom, oh my God, don't even get me started about my mother. Like that has been a traumatic from the day go. Um, I've actually had a lot of trauma. Yes. And I've never ad- admitted it until now, until you actually said that. Yes. And I think it's important to own that, to acknowledge that it doesn't mean, and I, I, I mean this when I say it, it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you. No, no, it's life. And you know, it happened been, to me. It happened to me. Yes. And you've been able in, in, a, in a wonderful way to manage all of it and end up where you are today, which is, you know, in a relationship, in a marriage, raising two kids, oh. having work for yourself and, and, and being a good person. Oh. And, and and being loved. Same- I mean, being loved by people. When I when I share my struggles with somebody, which is not often, they can't believe it. They're like, "What? How can you be struggling with this?" And I'm like, "Well, I am human, but yeah. to, to everybody who thinks I'm like oh, got my shit together." <laughs> Excuse yeah. my language. One of the ways I just want to point out to you that I think you deal with, I'm not safe which lives in your system at a deep level, one of the ways you deal with it is you, I think you have a high speed, but I think your natural speed is actually slower than how you present. So how you present is your mind moves quickly, Mm. your voice moves quickly, you move Mm. quickly, Mm. your body moves quickly, Mm. your gestures are quick, and part of that is because you're on alert. And Someone said to me two years ago, he said to me, just by the speed that you speak at, I can hear all the anxiety in your voice. Yes. I was like, what? He's like, just by the speed of your voice, I can hear the anxiety in your voice. Yes. And some, like, people naturally, some people naturally speak faster. That's okay. But, but I, I'm, I'm going to agree. I think that your speed, Speed, your natural speed, natural Haley is slower. And part of your speed is because when we are threatened, i.e. chronic stress response, i.e. PTSD to the brain, when we're under stress, time is running out. Yeah. Because when a lion is chasing you, guess what? Time is running out. out. It actually is running out. Nature understands that when you're threatened, when your life is being threatened, you you have a couple of minutes to either run or defeat the thing that's threatening you. But it's all over in two to three minutes in the natural world. So last week, my husband took me for coffee and he was sitting here and I was sitting here and he 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 went ahead of me like this to make a joke. He was he was doing this to look at my face and joke. And I thought he was. I thought somebody was running from this side and I went, <gasps> and he said, what are you doing? I said, oh, he said, relax, relax. Yeah. I was just coming in front of you to make a joke. Mm-hmm. He said, why did you feel so threatened? And I thought, shit, I do that all the time. I yeah. do that all the time. I'm on high alert. Yes. So that is simply, once again, there is nothing emotionally wrong with you. I just want to say that there's nothing intellectually wrong with you. To me, what is happening is you have an ingrained stress response that started at a young age that you haven't figured out how to unwind it yet. Well, I don't know. I had it until now. So thank you. (laughs) Exactly. So your homework between now and your last moments on planet Earth, which will hopefully be many decades from now, your homework assignment is to discover and explore how to unwind this stress response and unwind that trauma such that we get to the natural Haley. And yeah, the natural Haley is going to understand that, you know something, all things considered, I'm safe. Sure. You'll have moments of stress. I don't think I've felt that Haley. I don't think I've ever felt that Haley. She's who's who said Haley. Right. She's in there. She exists. And you have to want her. You have to want to discover her. So, again, I want to remind you that that working with some type of trauma therapist and sometimes you have to go through a few of them, because, like I said, they use different techniques 
And like anything else, like going to a doctor, like going to your hairdresser, some are better than others. Yeah, yeah. But I highly recommend the DNRS system, retraining your brain. Yeah, uh, it's 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 probably the easiest, fastest, best system you can do yeah. on your own that you can start to see a result as you practice it. Yeah, um, and I, it's all I, online, which is great. It's all available. Yeah. Yes, 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 and it's yeah. and it's and and it's very reasonably priced. And so, it's based on trauma, so it's 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 for PTSD. Yes. Yes, it was originally originally designed for people who had multiple chemical sensitivities okay. um, because uh, the person who created it, I, I think that was her issue. Mm -hmm. And she discovered that her multiple chemical sensitivities was actually being driven by this same thing, PTSD, by a stress response mm -hmm. that didn't unwind itself. And it turned out the work was applicable, not just for multiple chemical sensitivities, but for anybody yeah, with yeah. trauma. So it then developed into that. Okay. So I wanted very, to just very ask, helpful. I wanted to ask a question. Um, you know, when I explained earlier about my eating disorder changed, it went from binging, like an actual binge, to now spreading that out and just making all the wrong choices. Yes. Why does that happen? Why would I change my disorder? I mean, you know what I mean? Like, sure. Why would I go so, from a binge eater to a, I don't know what you call the other one. I don't know what you yes. call my current state. So in my opinion, why you did that is because you're actually evolving and you're actually moving forward and you're actually getting better. <laughs> I, I feel like I doing. am. I feel like I am. Yeah. You are, you are. So you yeah. feel like it. That's great. Yeah. And over here, what I'm hearing and listening for and acknowledging is that, strangely enough, that is actually an intelligent next step. So if you're going from binge eating, which is more haphazard, binge eating is more um, relatively unpredictable, and binge eating is also a place where we go unconscious. In order yeah. to binge eat, a part of you is checking out. Yeah, so you went I remember from that. that to having a rhythm. Oh, let me just eat three meals a day and a snack or two. Mm -hmm. So there's actually a rhythm to that, yeah. which is more healthy. Now, okay, you might not be making the best choices at that meal, but that was the transition that you could successfully do. Okay, yeah. I'm going to have a, a more conscious rhythm but I'm still going to have my chocolate and biscuits as a meal. Yeah. So I'll have three biscuits instead of the whole packets. <laughs> exactly. So <laughs> what I'm saying is that's an advancement, that's improvement and that's growth. Okay. That's the good. next step would be sure to start making choices at those meals that are healthy for you and that represent the adult woman in you and not the child in you. So the child in you mm -hmm. wants biscuits and chocolate. The child in you wants sugar. The child in you wants comfort food because it's the child in you who was unsafe. So whenever you're making those decisions mm -hmm. to eat a food that isn't on your, this is going to be helpful for me list. Yeah. Whenever you go against what your adult brain knows, it's because in that moment, the child in you is sitting to at the head of the table. I'm and not feeling she, safe. Yeah, she's making the choice because she doesn't feel safe. And her safety is more important than anything else because she doesn't want to die. <laughs> yeah, so exactly. it actually makes yeah. sense. It's a system that has yeah. no sensibility. And, I, and you, you, you said a while ago, you know, you've got to make friends with it. Yes. You know, you've got to make friends with food. You've got to make friends with whatever eating disorder you have. You've got to stop fighting. Yes. And I'm at that point now where I'm tired of fighting myself, you know, and yes. I'm actually, when I eat the biscuits, I'm like, okay, well, I'm not feeling safe and I want the biscuits and I don't have this blaming, criticizing, let me go exercise more afterwards. I just go, okay, well, I ate the biscuits. So what? So, you know, it, you've got to make friends with it. Yes. So congratulations on doing that. That's an important next step. And really what you're doing is you're taking deliberate baby steps to get where you need to go. And, and I'm over here saying, listening to your story, you're doing so many things right. And you've advanced yourself. 
So you've been successful on this journey and there's more to go. Yeah. And you're not going to be able to make the consistently good choices that you want to make until you start to address what's yes. underlying it, which is I don't I feel safe. I agree, because eating is actually just a representation of what's going on on the inside. Yes. You know, what you eat is just about what's happening on the inside. So we can, I, I wouldn't want to take away biscuits and chocolate from you. Because, well, not yet. Yeah. Right. Not, Be not until I feel safe. Yeah. 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 I would, I would never say to you, no, you, Haley, yeah. you must resist that with all the willpower in the world and do whatever you can to never think about chocolate yeah. and biscuits. And yeah. that. No. You said that before you said that in that one, you said, I would never take it away from you until you feel safe, until you yeah. feel emotionally okay. Why would I take away the thing from you that has made you safe all these years? Why would I punish exactly. you like that? Does it would never work. Exactly. Exactly. I listen to your things. Eh? I listen. <laughs> <laughs> you're great. You're really great. So, so your next step is to start to explore the universe called how to unwind trauma in my system. And it's really a very beautiful journey because what you're doing is you're healing your life and you're being reborn. Um, I understand this very well because I had a similar story because in the environment that I grew up in, I grew up in a very violent time in the United States. I, I was born in 1958 and I was a child during the civil rights movement. And I lived in a part of New York where there was just gang wars all the yeah. time. You know, yeah. I, I saw violence every day at school. I was involved in it. So I grew up in a world that wasn't safe. Plus there was, you know, the Vietnam war and there was yeah, the threat of yeah. nuclear annihilation, destroying the planet. And I'm thinking, my goodness. And then you married a woman from South Africa. Are you not? Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, so I understand, I, I remember the moment that I realized, Oh my goodness, I've spent my entire life not feeling safe. I was in my, wow. I was in my late thirties, as a matter of fact, oh. <laughs> when it really hit home for me. And I knew in that moment that until I was able to change that core belief yeah. Yeah. that I will continue to have all these strange behaviors that I didn't know where they yeah. were coming from. That I didn't want. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And all these anxieties and, yeah. and also hair trigger around anger, hair trigger around anger. All that is is something feels like it's threatening you. And what does an animal do when it feels threatened? Ouch. Oh, exactly. It growls. Yeah, exactly. It shows its yeah. teeth and it says, you come near me, I'm going to bite you. Yeah. So it doesn't matter what the trigger is for you. All the trigger needs to be is something that says to some part of your brain, this isn't yeah. a safe moment. This is a so, yeah, react to stress, react to stress. Yeah. Yes. And one of the ways to react to a threat is to get angry. One yeah, is to, to protect. To protect yeah. And yeah. the other is to be angry. So if your child does something that doesn't feel good to you, that it, your, your system is yeah. interpreting that as a threat to you. Yeah, for sure. So, 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 I mean, what was your, what did you do mainly? Did you go for like trauma therapy um, or did you do it on your own? Both. Yes. Yes. Okay. So I started working with different trauma modalities mm -hmm. and I worked on my own and developed different practices to constantly, I, I literally would constantly affirm to myself, I'm safe. I would notice the moments. Mm -hmm. I've been doing practice, that. And, 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 and I don't know that this works for you or for anybody, but what, what I did on my own was I noticed when I wasn't feeling safe, I decided to say to myself, hey, Mark, notice when you don't feel safe. Just just notice it. Yeah. And I started to notice, wow, that's a lot of experiences where I don't feel safe. And then in those moments, I would literally check in with myself and I would say, is this life threatening? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, exactly. Do I need to engage that threat response? Yes. And oh, you know something? I don't. I'm actually safe. I'm okay. Yeah. And do you think just by having that self-talk over and over and over again with some therapy, with some relaxation exercises, it will eventually rewire the pattern? 100% yes. 
100% yes, absolutely. Um, I, I made amazing strides for myself. Yeah. And it was life changing. Do you have any shadows of it left that you have to still work on it? That, that, that trauma system that. Oh yes, of course. I don't, I don't know that it ever ends in, in, in a strange way because, you know, we continue as you live life more, there's going to be stresses. Yeah. You know, your kids are going to grow up and they're going to get out. So, you know, things are going to happen. And then we have to, in those moments, remind ourselves, oh, okay, that, that was difficult for me. And I'm how do I, I manage okay. that? Yeah, yeah. How do I still feel safe? Oh even though this is a difficult situation. Yeah. So, yeah, so, okay. Yeah, sure. So I think it's a lifelong practice, but I, I, I believe, you know, getting to know you in this conversation that you have everything that it takes to get where you want to go. Mm. And, and again, I, I, I just want to emphasize to you that your behaviors around food will be able to shift and I yeah. think your chronic fatigue, your your fatigue will shift, your yeah. pain will shift. Well, that pain is a stress response. So the, what the, yes. the the rheumatoid doctor said to me, she said your pain receptors do not know how to switch off. Yes, they are on permanent overdrive between yes. your brain and your neck and your hip. It's like go, go, go. We are telling you there's a problem. Yes. And now that you've said this to me, it makes complete sense. Yes, because pain. Is it's letting you know yeah, I'm in a survival situation. Yeah. I just got bit by the lion. This is not good. Do something. So, oh, word. so you know, you've really dropped the penny tonight because I was like, oh, I've got fibro because I'm hypermobile and I just pushed my body too far. And I'm now understanding that shit, you excuse my language, you've actually got trauma. Like you, you've yes. actually got this consistent trauma, and that's why you have these consistent flare-ups of pain. Because your brain, your body doesn't know what to do. So it says, same pain, same pain. I'm not safe. I'm not safe. Exactly. Let's slow her down by making her sore because then maybe she'll just stop and stop running. Yes. So in a strange way, your challenge right now is really more of a spiritual practice. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's more of an internal practice of learning how to retrain your mind, yeah, which will then retrain the brain organ itself. Yeah, no, and, and I know that. I mean, I, I do understand the whole concept. Um, but you, you've told me what the thing is to train on, and that's what I was lit, I was missing. I was like, okay, so I know I don't feel safe, and I know I don't, I know I don't feel safe, and I don't, I know I don't feel certain, and I use food for that. But I couldn't figure out why I didn't feel safe in the first place. And now you've said to me, well, it's actually because you've had a whole life of trauma, and your body's learning to just fight, fight, fight. And I hadn't hadn't had that light bulb moment. So thank yes. you. Yes, yes, you are so welcome. And uh, you know, I'm so happy for you because you have the right resources to help yourself. And by yeah. resources, I mean, you have the experience, you have the smarts, you have the intuition, you have the mm. intelligence and you have love in your life. And yeah. that's a good foundation from which to begin to train your brain mm. that this world is safe. And, you know, I mentioned it's a spiritual practice because there's a certain paradox here. And, and the paradox is you and I are going to die someday and you and I are going to continue to, to go through life. And there's going to be beautiful moments and wonderful moments and average moments and challenging moments and stressful moments. So in a certain way, it's correct. The world isn't completely safe. And it's appropriate to not feel safe in the moments when it's actually not safe. <laughs> it's very Don't smart. Don't let it all go. Don't let it all go. <laughs> yes. So it's, so it's very smart. To Don't go play on the highway. Don't right. go play on the highway now because I feel safe. <laughs> exactly. Away from the highway. <laughs> exactly. So what I'm yeah. saying, it's, it's just a strange paradox because the world isn't safe all the time, but it's learning how to feel safe when it is safe. Yeah, yeah. So it's using that threat response when I actually need it. 
Yes. When I'm in danger, when my child's in danger, when I'm yes. about to get knocked over, then switch it on by all means. Yes. But the rest of life doesn't need to be that switching on of the stress response. Exactly. Exactly. I get it. Now I've just got to do it. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Well, that's the beginning. You know, the beginning of this journey is really wisdom. It's, it's, it's having wisdom and insight that can then guide you on your journey and guide you in your exploration. And in this conversation, we've, we've sort of landed where you've agreed, oh, okay, this is a next step on my journey. Absolutely. Not because I told you, but because I said it and it resonated for you. Absolutely. Yeah. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'm I'm very happy for you. And thank you. I appreciate very, it, Mark. Really, it's worth. It's been worth every minute. Um, thank you. I appreciate that. It's been worth every minute for me, and I'm sure it's going to be helpful for others. I really appreciate you, yeah. you just sharing openly and honestly. What a beautiful thing. Thank you, Mark. Thank you so much. Yeah, Haley. Thank you, and thanks everybody for tuning in, my friends. Take care. Hey friends, we're so happy that you've joined us for another episode of The Psychology of Eating with Mark David. Are you loving these episodes? Then simply subscribe and you'll never miss an episode again. We'd also love it if you'd leave us a comment below so we can hear more about your own journey with food and body. And if you're curious about what we offer at the Institute for the Psychology of Eating, including our internationally acclaimed coach certification training that's rooted in dynamic eating psychology and mind-body nutrition, please head on over to our website, psychologyofeating.com. Until next time, take care. And remember, having the body you want starts with loving the body you have.